This is the second sermon in our series called Love Unites Us, in which we're thinking about same-sex relationships. Throughout Britain, the Methodist Church are currently being asked to consider a consultation report, which alongside many other important things, concludes that we should move away from our traditional teaching on same-sex relationships and allow those churches and ministers who believe it right to do so to conduct weddings of same-sex couples. Last week I shared how over a period of decades my own views on this particular subject have changed through my encounters with remarkable Christians who also happen to be in strong, committed, stable, loving, gay relationships. I had previously accepted and strongly taught the view that the Bible is very clear in its condemnation of sex between two people of the same gender. I can no longer read the Bible that way. My encounter with gay Christians seems parallel to the Apostle Peter's encounter with non-Jewish Gentile believers. Until his encounter with the Roman centurion called Cornelius, Peter strongly accepted the traditional Jewish teaching that the Hebrew scriptures utterly condemned eating certain foods which are clearly categorised as unclean. And he accepted the received wisdom that if a non-Jewish Gentile truly wanted to become a faithful worshipper of the one true God, that would necessarily require them to give up eating these unclean foods. And yet, as chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Acts recounts, when Peter entered the house of Cornelius and witnessed these unclean Gentiles being filled with the Holy Spirit, he was forced to rethink all he had known about this. His conclusion recorded in Acts chapter 11 and verse 17 was this, so if God gave them the same gift he gave to us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? The early church remained deeply divided on this particular issue. And as we saw last week in Romans 14, the Apostle Paul referred to it as a disputable matter. He called Christians to recognise the strength of feeling on either side of the argument and to each do what they felt to be genuinely right before God. The Christian approach to same-sex relationships is arguably the disputable matter in the church today. I myself know this keenly because I used to stand on one side of the argument and now stand on the other. I used to believe that the Bible was very clear on this issue and that to condone and accept same-sex relationships necessarily involved a complete disregard for the scriptures. I no longer believe that. I still maintain a high view of the scriptures. I believe that God speaks through the pages of the Bible. What I am not so confident about is our ability to interpret those scriptures correctly. At different times in the church's history, Christians have interpreted the scriptures to justify genocide, slavery, inequality and injustice. It is a dangerous book and we should interpret it with great care and apply what we interpret with great humility. The discipline of biblical interpretation is called hermeneutics and there is nothing straightforward about it. We are dealing with many different texts written over hundreds of years by many different people whose experience, understanding, context and culture are each quite different to our own. To make things even more difficult, the various Bible texts were not written in English. They were mainly written in Hebrew or in Greek. So when we read our English Bibles, we are not actually reading what the Bible really says, but only some translator's interpretation of the original text. And if you have ever compared the various English translations of the Bible, then you will know that translations do differ. 
And all of this is important to keep in mind when it comes to the very few Bible texts which refer to same-sex relationships. In the whole of the Bible, there are just five passages that clearly talk directly on this subject. The first two are in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. They're found in Leviticus 18 and 20 and form part of what scholars call the Holiness Code, which gives a list of rules and regulations and rituals given to help the Israelites maintain their separate identity in the Promised Land. They were entering a land swarming with various different tribes, often collectively referred to as the Canaanites. The whole idea was that they needed to keep themselves separate and distinct to ensure that they survived and thrived as a holy people for God. It seems that the Canaanites did not possess many rules around sex. So the Holiness Code sets out some rules for the Israelites, and these include the following two texts. Leviticus 18 verse 22 says this, Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Then Leviticus 20 verse 13 is similar and says this, If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their hands. The Hebrew word here for detestable appears as abomination in older translations. It is the Hebrew word to ive, which means something that is distasteful to God. It is used in the Old Testament not only for men sleeping with men, but also to describe, alongside other things, trimming your beard, weaving two different kinds of yarn into the same garment, and eating specified foods that are deemed to be unclean. The death penalty mentioned in Leviticus 20 is given in the same chapter for other things, including, for example, cursing your parents. There is no doubt here that all of these things were indeed being ruled out for the Israelites as they entered the land of the Canaanites over 3,000 years ago in the early Iron Age. What is in doubt is whether these same things are being ruled out for us in the 21st century. 2,000 years ago, when the early church allowed Gentile Christians to eat unclean food, they knew very well that they were breaking the Holiness Code in Leviticus, which is why it was such a big deal for the early church. Today, many of us break the same Holiness Code quite regularly. I've already broken it three times today. First, when I had a shave. Second, when I put on a cotton and wool blend shirt. And then third, when I had a bacon butty. So we know what Leviticus says but we also know that seen in its context, it is arguable whether it is definitive for us on the issue of same-sex relationships. So let's turn to the New Testament. First, we're going to two related passages, both written by the Apostle Paul. First, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 to 10, that says this, Do you not know Wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revelers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Then 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 9 to 11. This means understanding the law that is laid down, not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, for murderers, fornicators, male prostitutes, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary 
to sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. For our purposes, the key words in these so-called vice lists are translated here as male prostitutes and sodomites. The original Greek words are malakoi and arsenokoite. These are very difficult words to translate into English. Malakoi has been variously translated as weaklings, effeminate, those who make women of themselves, sensual, sissies, male prostitutes and boy prostitutes. Arsenokoitai has been translated as abusers of themselves with mankind, liars with mankind, sodomites, given to unnatural vice, people with infamous habits, perverts and even child molesters. Then in 1946 someone made the decision to take these two Greek words and translate them both as homosexual. So translations such as the Revised Standard Version speak against homosexuality in these two places. The Greek word malakos literally means soft and was used as a term of abuse for men who took the passive position in gay sex. In Paul's time, malakos was a term often used to describe young male prostitutes. The second word is more controversial. No one can be sure what arsenokoitai really means because it appears in no other Greek writing. Even so, many scholars think that if malakos is the younger passive participant, then arsenokoitai is probably the older active participant in male-on-male -male sex. In the Greco-Roman society of Paul's day, such activities between men and boys happen not only in gay prostitution, but also in the gymnasium and baths, and also within the worship of some pagan temples. There also existed a unique relationship known as pederasty, where an older, wealthier, often married man took under his wing a younger man with permission of the younger man's father for the purposes of teaching and mentoring and befriending. And often such relationships included sex between the older and the younger man. Greek literature contains many examples of this pederasty and it is known to have been quite acceptable in the parts of Roman society Paul was dealing with. So it seems highly likely that these two vice lists of Paul are referring either to gay prostitution or to casual sex, temple worship or pederasty, and not at all to anything approaching the exclusive, committed, stable, loving gay relationships that we're talking about today. Which leaves us with one final text, which is Romans chapter 1 verses 24 to 27 in which the Apostle Paul says this therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised Amen because of this God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. The context and argument of this passage suggests that Paul is most likely referring to the specific gay sex acts that formed part of worship in some pagan temples. One of the key points here upon which scholars disagree is how to understand the Greek word which we translate as natural. It seems that Paul is working on the assumption that everybody is born straight and that anybody who participates in this pagan gay sex 
is turning their back on their natural sexuality and is choosing to do something that they should find unnatural. Scholars who take the traditional interpretation of this text often point to the way our bodies have been designed. It is physically natural, they say, for a woman to have sex only with a man, as it is physically natural for a man to have sex only with a woman. The complementary design of male and female bodies makes this natural, and so anything other than that is clearly unnatural. The only problem with that argument is that sexuality is very far from being purely physical. Emotionally and psychologically, many of us may well feel attracted exclusively to people of the opposite sex, but the proven reality is that some of us only feel exclusively attracted to people of the same sex, and others are attracted to either sex. Paul, it seems, is not aware of this, but we are. We're aware of it, and that fact does shed a whole different light on what Paul is saying here. Consequently, what some scholars now argue is that if you are gay, lesbian or bisexual, then what is natural for straight people is quite unnatural for you. In which case, these words of Paul in Romans 1 would suggest that for a gay person to make love with someone of the opposite sex would be for them abandoning natural relations and committing a shameful act. So depending on which interpretation you favour, Romans 1 either completely rules out the practice of same-sex relationships or it completely legitimises them. So there you have it. Those are the only five verses in the whole of the Bible that directly address same-sex relationships. The Old Testament doesn't refer to them anywhere else. The New Testament doesn't talk about them anywhere else. And Jesus says nothing about them at all. I've come to believe very strongly that how we each read these particular texts says far more about us than it does about the texts themselves. When it comes to issues of sexuality, we are each deeply conditioned by the traditions within which we've been raised, by the culture within which we feel most at home, and by our personal experiences throughout our lives. And like it or not, all of that warps our reading of these scriptures. My own black and white reading of these scriptures was only seriously challenged when I encountered what I had previously believed to be an impossibility, namely spirit-filled, Bible-believing followers of Jesus who also happened to be in long-term, stable, committed and loving same-sex relationships. One of the questions I have asked myself is what are the fruits of my theology on this subject? There is no doubt in my mind that the traditional theology of same-sex relationships produces in the lives of many gay people all kinds of serious mental health issues, self-harm, or even worse. By contrast, a more inclusive theology yields in their lives the fruit of belonging, freedom, safety, and security. I believe this latter approach reflects more the love of Christ. In Matthew 18, verse 6, Jesus says this, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. I used to think that to condone or accept any form of same-sex relationships was to be guilty of causing young Christians to stumble. But I now believe that to condemn committed, faithful, loving same-sex relationships is to be guilty of causing young Christians to stumble. 
I personally believe that the church's condemnation has strongly supported a culture in our society and churches that is oppressive and poisonous to young gay people. If nothing else, then the rate of depression and suicide among them should make us rethink our approach. There are some gay Christians who hold to the traditional interpretation of the five texts and have therefore taken a vow of celibacy. And I have the utmost respect for them and for the choice they've made. I recognise that the traditional interpretation of the five texts is clearly open to us. I just happen now to believe it to be neither the only interpretation nor the best. Let us pray. Loving God, Jesus prayed for the unity of his disciples and right now we need your help with that. So by your spirit help us to keep on loving one another even where we hold strongly opposed opinions. We pray especially for those who are directly impacted by our conversations on this particular subject. For those who are gay, for their families and friends, and for those church ministers who have the heavy responsibility of interpreting the scriptures in this area. We pray for the Methodist Church as it consults on this matter, that you would help us all to speak about our beliefs in a way that conveys the greatest care, love and sensitivity towards one another. As in all matters, we pray that, as Jesus taught us, thy kingdom would come, thy will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.